Hello, my name is Richard, and I've been in a relationship for about five years. I met my girlfriend on Tinder, and since then, everything has been wonderful. You know, it's a miracle that I'm with my girlfriend since I have a dark history with Tinder. Let's just say that on Tinder, there are very good people and very bad people. And among a tiny percentage, hidden among the meanest people, there is Angela, the most cruel and evil person I have ever met. In the beginning, Angela didn't really seem like a bad person. I found her on Tinder and she stood out among all the girls. At first, I thought there was no way she was going to like me back. She was too cute for me and I knew it, but it didn't hurt to try. As soon as I gave her a like, I left my cell phone and went to get something to eat. But as soon as I was leaving, my cell phone rang. It was a notification from Tinder. And to my absolute surprise, I had made a match with Angela. After that, everything went pretty smoothly. We started talking and to my amazement, Angela was charming. She had a magnetic personality that immediately grabbed me. We shared similar tastes. We had the same sense of humor and our conversations were fluid and engaging. Days passed, then weeks, and our virtual connection grew stronger. Everything was going great until we decided to meet. One cold autumn night, Angela suggested we meet in a secluded spot. Although it seemed strange, I didn't question it. Maybe she liked quiet places. Not all girls were restaurant people or crowd pleasers. We met in a small dark park where the shadows stretched out like long fingers of darkness. When I arrived, Angela was already there, a charming smile on her face. To my surprise, she set something down beside her. Hey, what did you bring a Polaroid for? To capture moments. Sit down, you'll understand. We sat on a bench and for a while, everything was normal. Angela asked me a bit about my life and I asked her a bit about hers. Nothing separated this date from a normal one, but gradually the atmosphere changed. Hey, have you ever killed any animals? What? what Excuse me? I was joking. Calm down. I thought you had a sense of humor. Even though she told me it was a joke, something in her eyes had changed. Before she had a calm, attentive, and careful look, now it was very different. Her eyes were wide open. Her gaze was fixed on me. Her head was shaking, and I could see her biting the skin on her lips in anticipation. The date started to get a lot more awkward. I was trying to bring up normal topics. Movies, work, college. Whatever would make this talk normal again. But something had changed in her. It was as if she had lost complete interest in whatever I was saying. By this point in the evening, I was very uncomfortable and could only think of one excuse to leave. Hey, I've had a great time, but uh, I think I should go. My mother is sick and I have to take care of her. I could get away for a while, but I feel like I've left her alone for too long. Oh, of course. I understand. Are you very close to your mother? Of course. I never knew my father, and my mother took care of me and my siblings by herself when we were kids. She is very brave. You know, I'm very close to my mom, too. Do you want to see a picture of her before you go? Of course. Angela reached for a picture on her cell phone. Suddenly, she was acting more normal. Maybe I was being a little over the top with her. As she reached for the picture on her cell phone, I couldn't help but notice how cute she was. It was as if she had a glow of her own, a unique joy that made her unlike anyone I had ever met before. Here, I found a picture of her. Look at it. I grabbed the cell phone eagerly, and when I looked at the screen, I was confused at first. At first, I was confused, but when I understood what I was seeing, I froze. In the picture, there was a woman who looked very similar to Angela, but she was dead, dismembered, cut into pieces. Angela was in the picture, too. Blood was all over her body, especially on her face, which had a huge smile and eyes similar to the ones she had a few minutes ago. A flash brought me back to reality. She was with the Polaroid in her hand, taking a picture of me. See, you always have to be ready to capture the best moments. You should see your reaction. Angela, tell me this is a joke. Tell me this is a joke in bad taste. Please tell me this is not real. It's all a joke. You have nothing to worry about. As I was saying that, something shone against my face. That's when I realized that Angela had a huge knife in her hands. Before she could use it, I got up from my chair and started to run. I watched as Angela reacted to try to grab me before I left, but she didn't do it fast enough. I ran as fast as I could. I had to get away from that place. I had to get to a police station to report what I saw. It might just be a person with a knife who I had already left behind, but I felt that the danger was more latent than ever. As I ran, I heard an engine behind me and saw a speeding car. It was Angela. I tried to get off the road as quickly as possible, but it was too late. Before I could jump out, 
She hit me with the car on the side of my body, and I fell down injured. Angela braked her car a few meters later and headed towards me. The park had already ended, and I was in an area with huge grassland and several trees. Luckily for me, I was able to crawl in the dark and hide behind a tree. Angela was looking for me, walking slowly, examining the whole area. She didn't know where I was, but I felt that every step I took, she was getting a little closer. For a moment, I came to believe that she really did see me, only that she was making me suffer as long as possible. She was already a few steps away from me. She was going to kill me, and she was just going to make one more antidote of Angela. One more picture for her collection. I wanted to defend myself, but my body hurt too much. I couldn't even stand up. Suddenly, as Angela was about to find me, a group of friends walked by. Hey, are you okay? <laughs> of course. I just lost a, a ring. You can go. Thank you very much. Don't worry. We'll help you look for it. No! I've, I've already found it. Thank you very much anyway. And that's when it was all over. Angela simply went back to her car and sped off, to the confused looks of the other guys, knowing she was clearly lying but not interested enough to investigate what Angela was really looking for. I took advantage of that moment to crawl away from that area, and when I had reached a point where Angela would not find me, I called one of my brothers who picked me up. Once my brother dropped me off at the hospital, I called the police, but they couldn't find Angela. She had no social networks, her Tinder profile had disappeared, and she had made sure that no clues led back to her. I even doubt that her real name is Angela. As I told you before, I gave Tinder a try again, and that time, it worked out well. I met my current partner in a public place, and I had already seen all her social networks before we met. I never heard from Angela again, and to tell you the truth, I'm thankful I didn't. Who knows what Angela might have done, who she might have met on Tinder, and what fate would have befallen those poor people who perhaps, unlike me, could not escape. Hello, everyone. We are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. For a 50-year-old divorcee, life is no piece of cake. You invest all your youth in a man only for him to cheat on you when you lose your youth and your skin starts to have wrinkles. That's my story, by the way. After the divorce, I moved into my aunt's house where she left me in her will. The house was a bit old, but had a classic vintage vibe to it. It was a two-story house with two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a spacious living room. Both of my kids are happily married and busy with their lives while I am adjusting to this new single life. The only good part about the post-divorce life is the peace of mind I have and this beautiful house. I have a stable job. But sometimes the loneliness gets to me. When I shared this with my daughter, she told me to go on Tinder. I am a woman who met men at bars and at friends' birthday parties. Back in the day, we didn't have these online dating options. So I was appalled that my daughter would even suggest something like that. But after a few weeks, when meeting men in person was getting more and more difficult, I created a profile on Tinder. My daughter even helped me to make my profile more appealing. Interesting enough, there were a lot of single men on this app who were around my age and going through a similar life situation. I matched with a few men, but it fizzled out as soon as it started. My dating life had come alive after almost 30 years. I was having some troubles in the house. Every night, I heard screams and banging of cabinet doors at night. At first, I thought someone had broken into my house, but later, I realized that it was an old house. And sometimes at night, when the temperature dropped and the wind blew, the house made creepy noises. Also, there was a big floor-to-ceiling mirror fixed right in front of the stairs that led upstairs. I hated that mirror. Not only was it placed in the wrong place, it was also very old. I hired a contractor to get it off the wall, but the darn thing wouldn't budge. I decided to let it go, but as the days passed, the mirror freaked me out more and more. But then one evening, while I was having dinner all by myself, my phone buzzed, and I had matched with one man. His name was Michael. He was recently divorced and was looking for a loving female companion. 
He was two years my senior and was living in the same city. We began chatting, and soon the chatting turned into constant texting. We were always talking to each other. Michael was just so easy to talk to. Also, somehow, we had a lot more in common. It felt as if I had met him sometime. We even started talking on phone calls. He sounded a bit old, but I knew the stress of a separation can age you quickly. I didn't mind one bit. In all the pictures he sent me of himself, he looked like a man in his mid-fifties, with salt-and-pepper hair, average height, and a comparatively lean build. He was exactly the man I would go for. We talked all the time, and this made me forget all the strange occurrences in my house. We talked about everything, our kids, our jobs, our exes, our early life, and even what we want from our future. It felt wholesome to find someone who aligns with you, your vision, and your expectations so well. But there was one thing that used to put me off all the time. Even after weeks of talking, Michael was not yet ready to meet me. We lived in the same city, so it would not be difficult for us to meet up over dinner or lunch, perhaps. But he always gave me excuses. Sometimes it would be work, commitments with his kids and whatnot. I always believed him, because he made me feel like a teenager who was experiencing love for the first time. Yes, I had fallen in love with him in such a short period, without even meeting him once. I even told my daughter that he might be the one. My sad life had taken a complete 360 after matching with Michael. I was so thankful that I took my daughter's advice and installed Tinder. One night, however, as I was sleeping, the noises in my house were too loud. I grabbed a glass vase from my bedroom and slowly walked downstairs but found the house completely empty. I chalked it up to be nothing and slept peacefully. The next day, however, I had a meeting in the neighboring town, so I was going to be out of town for two days. I checked into the hotel, all while I and Michael were constantly communicating. He had sent me a picture of him in his kitchen cooking breakfast. It was so wonderful that we shared pictures of such small moments with each other. The hotel was very big, so I decided to walk in the park while I spoke on a call with Michael. We spent a good hour talking to each other and hung up as it was dinner time. As I was walking towards the dining hall, I saw a man standing in the hallway. And I had a very broad smile on my face. I immediately ran up to him and threw myself in his arms. I was hoping that the man would hug me back, but instead, he pushed me aside and looked very perplexed and even a bit scared. I instantly sobered up and said, Michael, hey, it's me, Bella. He stared at me for a good five seconds, and then said in a very polite tone, I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't know who you are. You probably mistook me for someone else. Aren't you Michael? I asked while I controlled hard to reel back my tears. No, ma'am. I'm Alex. Even though my brain had accepted what was happening, my heart refused to believe that my Michael would do something like that with me. Michael, please do not prank me. This is serious, I said. That's when a woman approached us and intertwined her hands with the man in front of me. She asked him what was wrong. He politely explained. The woman looked at me with worry. I whipped my phone out and went to Tinder. I showed the man and the woman all the text and the photos. These are photos I've posted on Instagram. And I'm not on Tinder, ma'am. This is my wife. I don't need these apps. I think someone has catfished you. The reality of my situation sunk in at that moment, and I just ran back to my room crying hysterically. I was so heartbroken that I just wanted to go home and curl up in my bed and cry. I didn't give a shit about the meeting or anything at all. I checked out that night itself and drove home bawling my eyes out. The moment I reached home, my neighbor, an elderly woman, was walking her dog out. She called out to me and said, It was nice meeting your new boyfriend this afternoon. He is a really sweet man, and I got lucky twice. I did not understand a thing, and I was not in the headspace to process anything the woman said. But the moment I stepped into my house, my mind was instantly lifted off Michael and me being catfished and brought back to reality. 
All the lights were on. The TV was on. There were snacks on the kitchen counter. There was a load of laundry in the dryer and a bunch of dishes and cups in the sink. I thought maybe my daughter was home, but when I checked the whole house, there was no one. I immediately called the police. I was so drained emotionally that I did not even feel scared at that moment. While I was descending the stairs, my sight fell on the huge-ass mirror, and as I saw my reflection in it, all the emotions came swirling back, and I just grabbed a hammer from the kitchen and started hitting the mirror. The cops arrived soon after, and I had barely chipped the huge mirror when they asked me what was wrong. I told them that someone had broken into my home and had used everything. They scouted the whole house and found no one. One of the officers asked me why I was breaking the mirror, and I told him that I hated it. He took one look at it and told me to stand back. He took the hammer from me and broke the mirror in two hits. Behind the mirror was a wooden door, which I had no clue about. The cops kicked open the door, and there was a small room with a bed, some books, some food and clothes, and on the bed lay a skinny man. They immediately arrested him and went through his belongings. I was so scared and devastated that I did not even know how the hell my life changed so much in less than 24 hours. When they checked his phone, he too was on Tinder, and turns out he was Michael, or should I say he was catfishing me, pretending to be Michael. When the cops interrogated him, he confessed that he had moved into the secret room soon after my aunt died and was living there rent-free for years, but then suddenly I moved in and he could not move around the home freely. So to distract me and keep me occupied, he found out that I was on Tinder and catfished me, pretending to be the man of my dreams. He picked up some photos from the internet of a guy I might like, and his plan was working fantastically until I showed up unannounced at home that night. He used the two-way mirror to keep an eye on me. I was so traumatized by the events of that night that I moved in with my daughter and her husband for a couple of days and then sold that house to purchase an apartment for me. The guy was put behind bars, but I am still too traumatized from that event to fully open up myself to love again. And I definitely have sworn off dating apps for the rest of my life.